In my deep dive into the crisis communication literature between 1953 and 2015, and analyzing all 690 different journal articles that I found, I found more than 90 distinctive theories directly applied to academic research, and that's not an exhaustive list. Don't worry, we're not going to summarize all 90 theories that have been used in crisis communication research over the last 50 years. While the journal articles represent a substantial portion of the articles published across these six decades, there are articles certainly that I didn't capture in the study, and in the four years since, there have been additional theories developed or applied. But overall, these theories can be broken down into three broad groups, and so I'll provide a brief overview and some examples from within each of the groups risk and crisis theories, communication theories, and theories from complementary fields of study. Over the last few decades, a number of risk and crisis theories have been developed. These can be broken down into three broad subgroups of theories. Risk-oriented theories focus mostly on risk mitigation, that is, reducing the likelihood that crises will happen at all, or if they happen, that either stakeholders or organizations will be better prepared for them. Message-centered theories are not surprisingly at the heart of much of the crisis communication research that occurs. Collectively, these theories make specific recommendations about the types of message strategies that should be enacted across different kinds of crises and with different kinds of audiences. Crisis theories represent diverse, multidisciplinary group of theories that help organizations to diagnose the specific risks and problems that issues and crises create for them, for example, the stakeholder relationship model. And they show how to learn from crises and what to expect throughout the crisis life cycle. A few examples of risk-oriented theories include the ideal model. This is a stakeholder-centered model whose goal is to get people to take precautions to either avoid or minimize the impacts of events like natural disasters or disease on themselves or their businesses. The social amplification of risk framework is also a stakeholder-centered model that tries to explain why people can misjudge the potential negative impacts of risks, which ultimately affects their willingness or their ability to take precautionary measures to avoid them. Researchers have found that the ways that risks are discussed in the media, cultural groups, and interpersonal networks affects how much risk people perceive. A final example from this category is the Crisis, Emergency, and Risk Communication Model, or CERC, which focuses on the intersection of health communication and complex events like disasters. The theory's objective is to identify the kinds of communication activities that are appropriate for various stage of disasters or crises in order to help manage the total situation from pre to post crisis stages. A few examples of message centered crisis theories include image repair theory or IRT, which is one of the first genuine crisis communication theories and helped establish crisis communication as a distinctive area of study. It argues that one of the core functions of crisis communication is to repair the damage done to an organization's image, and that responses must take into account the nature of the crisis before developing its strategy. The theory, therefore, makes a number of situational recommendations about crisis response strategy. Situational Crisis Communication Theory, or SCCT, has also made a meaningful contribution to the development and institutionalization of crisis communication, and as we've discussed, focuses on addressing situational factors like blame attribution that influence how stakeholders evaluate particular crisis response strategies and argues that managers make informed choices about crisis response strategies based upon theoretically derived and empirically tested evidence. Social Mediated Crisis Communication, or SMCC, blends together media richness theory, cross-platform crisis communication, and stakeholder reactions to messages in order to better understand stakeholder information needs, information sharing, and messaging in disaster contexts. This is a particularly innovative example of message theory because it directly includes social media and legacy media engagement as part of active crisis response. Aside from the stakeholder relationship model, a few examples of other general crisis theories include Internet Crisis Potential, which is a marketing-based model that focuses on the way that organizations 
should use online monitoring in order to improve their agility in issue identification and crisis response. The integrated crisis mapping model provides a mechanism for organizations to analyze social media, especially Twitter, in order to gauge public sentiment about the organization and the crisis, and then inform them around the construction of messages to help stakeholders emotionally cope with crises. Then crisis management theory provides a multidisciplinary shell structure meant to provide an integrated management approach to crisis management. Heath argues that using a central management hub with coordinated activities connects personnel, communication, internal communication, image management, and situational response offering organizations the best approach to successfully managing crises. Not surprisingly, a substantial portion of the crisis communication research that I reviewed also applies traditional communication theories to understand, evaluate, and develop crisis response strategies. We've already discussed a number of these throughout the book, like expectancy violation theory, credibility, and the extended parallel process model. These can be broken down into five subgroups, and I'll address the broad contributions across the subgroups rather than providing specific examples of these theories. Traditional public relations and communication theories are commonly used in crisis communication because the principles governing stakeholder relationship management are aligned with the work in interpersonal communication, public relations, and organizational communication. For example, we discuss how expectancy violation theory helps us to understand how stakeholders might react if a crisis shakes their view of an organization's image or culture. But theories like contingency theory help practitioners and researchers alike to consider what factors must be taken into account when planning a response to any situation. We've also spent a considerable amount of time in discussing the importance of persuasion theories in understanding and predicting the in factors that influence stakeholder reactions to both crises and crisis response messages. Good persuasion theory grounds much of the messaging strategy used across the field of communication and not just in crisis situations. Yet in crisis communication, we find that we share a lot of theory with our health campaign colleagues because good, good health campaigns and crisis response often tries to manage emotions, expectations, and better persuade stakeholders to act or respond to situations in particular ways. In particular, theories like inoculation theory have been used to help industries improve their image over time. Additionally, rhetorical theories have also been used in crisis response in order to help us better understand the structure and nature of arguments that can and should be used to respond to crises. If persuasion theory grounds much of crisis response strategy that's used to help organizations manage crises, then rhetorical theory often grounds the persuasion theories that are developed, so it's useful to understand the nature and structure of argument if we are to develop effective crisis response messages. But one of the realities of responding to crises is that organizations also have to manage the media, owned, earned, and bought. As a result, media theories are applied in order to understand the nature of agenda setting, which we'll discuss later, what drives people to use particular media in different circumstances, and even what drives people to make decisions about whether crises will affect other people beyond themselves. And of course, if we're going to talk about media theories, we also have to acknowledge the important contributions that technology-related communication theories have made to crisis communication by helping us to understand the ways that social media has fundamentally changed the way that we collect, process, and share information. As I pointed out in the outset of the series, the field of crisis communication is an interdisciplinary field of study, with research occurring across the STEM fields, management, social sciences, and humanities, communication, and a number of applied industries. I also argue that if we want to understand what crisis communication is, we really must be reading broadly across domains in order to prepare us for practice and application. Likewise, we must also be drawing from fields that complement what communication does in order to build and apply theory in different types of crises as well. For example, a lot of the most innovative analyses and theories relating to social media and crisis communication, and we're talking theories that literally contribute to saving lives during disasters, is coming from the field of computer science because they're able to dig into networks most effectively. 
Mo moreover, it shouldn't be surprising that the field of psychology makes substantial contributions in theory and practice within crisis communication as well. However, in terms of building particular theories that drive crisis response and analysis, there are five fields of study that I found most contribute to our research. Psychology and learning, organizational, marketing and advertising, management and leadership, and cultural studies. Across any of these theory domains, we can make and see important contributions to issues, risk, and crisis response, depending on the nature of the circumstances, stakeholders, issues, and organization. But that's the critical challenge, trying to figure out how to develop theory-informed crisis response. Being familiar with any of these theories across the categories doesn't necessarily mean we can use them well. So let me leave you in this podcast with a point I made in the other theory podcast. I go back to my opening sports analogy in building a great playbook. This is something that Benoit and Coombs both talked about as they introduced their theories, the importance of having a sound strategy for building a successful crisis response. So how do we translate this sports analogy into theory-informed crisis response? It's about good decision-making.